Welcome back to Media Law and we're moving on to Module 2 now and uh, this is Module 2A looking at the material covered in Chapter 4 of the textbook to do with open justice and freedom of information. This is just a mini lecture of course and we'll just talk conversationally about some of the key topics that are covered but you need to supplement that by reading the chapter very, very closely and listening into the full lecture that's available to you. Well, open justice is an interesting term and uh, it's one of those terms where it speaks for itself. The processes of justice should normally be open and the courts have ruled to this effect uh, for hundreds of years that the default position should normally be that the courts and the justice system are open. And in your textbook, uh, you, the key case that it mentions there is the 1913 case of Scott against Scott, where some of that historical background to open courts is actually covered, and it talks about the idea of open courts and open justice dating in England back to Saxon times, back to the 12th and 13th centuries. And even in the notorious Star Chamber, uh, that court was meant to be open so that the processes of justice could be seen to be done by the whole community. Scott and Scott also quotes the great uh, philosopher, Jeremy Bentham, talking about publicity being the soul of justice. And I'm sure you can think of many reasons why it's to both societies and the citizens' advantage that the processes of the courts and justice are indeed open. These include things like people following the law, if they know that there are consequences for their actions, through being able to go into the courtroom to witness justice being done and people uh, being, you know, having to account for their crimes. Uh, not only that, um, it, not only does it send that message, but it also means that people might have a greater respect for the law and the actual workings of the justice system if they can learn to see it and understand it. Now, for the media, uh, this has huge advantages because while that may well be a reason why many uh, media outlets cover court to tell society about the workings of the courts and so that people can learn that they get punished for their wrongdoing, while that may be one reason, it's also a very interesting topic for, stu for, um, for audiences. And um, if, the, if the media are the eyes and the ears of the public in the court, uh, what that expression means is that not every, not every citizen can get to the courtroom, but they might at least be able to hear about a particular case on television, on the radio, through social media, or uh, in their newspaper. Uh, so the media are the eyes and ears of the court that way, but it also makes for very interesting reading and viewing for their audiences, particularly for the notorious cases, the big whodunits, where there is some murder mystery in society and the media latch onto that because they know their uh, audiences are so interested in it. Open justice in Australia uh, has an interesting history which, which is tracked in the textbook. But there have been some important decisions that are mentioned there, uh, particularly the Rabos case that it, that it mentions where some important exceptions to the principle of open justice have been raised. And so these cases have said that the courts will normally be open to the media and to the public, but there will sometimes be notable exceptions where other rights and interests of citizens or perhaps parties or greater social um, and governmental interests need to take priority over uh, the public's right to attend court cases and the media's right to report upon them. 
And these sorts of cases we've learned, um, and, and they might vary somewhat between different states and territories. But one example uh, might be children's courts where uh, the public may not be allowed to attend and neither may the media, depending on the jurisdiction. And in other circumstances, uh, the media may be able to attend, but the case and the identities of those involved might need to be fully anonymised. Similarly, with um, sexual assault cases, uh, there are various restrictions that we learn about later in the course attached to that. Other examples springing to mind are uh, family court matters, because these are often very sensitive private matters, and so uh, the Family Court, the, fa uh, the, the Family Law Act has uh, very strict uh, restrictions on, on publishing or covering those sorts of proceedings and others are to do with things like uh, mental health proceedings and the court's ability to or powers to issue suppression orders on particular cases uh, for a whole host of reasons. Uh, sometimes these might be to do with national security matters it could be to do with the fact that the case involves some extortion where there are very personal facts involved and it would be discouraging to people to come forward with their uh, claims of blackmail or extortion if they knew that this was going, the public was going to be able to uh, hear those, uh, those facts and, um, and the media to publish them. So they're just some of the examples. The textbook details in, in uh, much more comprehensively uh, all of the exceptions to, um, to open justice in those, in those terms. At the other extreme, the courts have taken very, um, very serious measures in recent times to uh, be more transparent so that justice can be done, can be seen to be done, and so that the public can engage much more with the courts and the justice process. And in the social media era, era we found a number of initiatives by the courts and the justice system to open their doors and processes to much more public debate and scrutiny. An example of that is some of the courts, uh, and Victorian courts were a leader in this, some have opened up um, through their court information offices, public relations practitioners attached to the court, they've opened up social media feeds uh, from the Supreme Court of Victoria and some other courts uh, that you can find them on uh, their Facebook and their Twitter feeds uh, where they are explaining decisions, notifying the public of important decisions and educating the public about their processes. There's also the issue of, um, of whether uh, some court proceedings might be videoed and transmitted. And this has become a matter of debate in, in many court uh, systems. Uh, some courts have decided to allow this uh, on an exceptional basis. And what we found is major royal commission hearings or sentencing or, um, or judgment in, uh, in very serious or notorious crimes uh, sometimes the magistrate or judge has decided to allow a fixed camera for the media to be there uh, to televise, televise the proceedings. Important royal commissions like that into uh, bushfires in, in, in Victoria and uh, the royal commission into institutional uh, abuse uh, have live streamed their proceedings so that the public can watch it as it's happening because they've seen it, that as a very important way of uh, the public learning more about their operations and their decision making. The, um, uh, the, those sorts of digital dimensions are very important. Uh, another example of that is that in some jurisdictions the courts have allowed journalists to tweet from court as a, a routine. Now, some of those, like South Australia, have various protocols that journalists need to follow. A delay before they are allowed to uh, send a tweet from the courtroom about proceedings. A discretion for the judge or magistrate to withdraw that permission. And in other jurisdictions, um, journalists still need to ask the permission of the court to engage in that sort of behaviour. But what that means is that journalists have a range of uh, what we might call privileges uh, in the court system where they sometimes have slightly more access uh, 
or the, the system is slightly more open for journalists than for other, uh, other citizens. The other big topic area in chapter four is to do with freedom of information, which in some parts of, of Australia is called the right to information, or RTI. FOI for freedom of information, and RTI for the right to information. Now, uh, freedom of information has a long international history. It first arose in Sweden. It's been traced to Sweden um, more than 250 years ago. So it has a long history in some parts of the world. Uh, in Australia, it is much more of a recent phenomenon. But there are more countries in the world that do have uh, freedom of information laws of some kind, and certainly all of the major Western democracies have freedom uh, of information laws. In Australia, uh, we didn't have any freedom of information law until we had it at a federal level in the Freedom of Information Act 1982. Uh, since then, uh, both at the Commonwealth or federal level and in most states and territories, we now have a Freedom of Information or a Right to Information Act that's been enacted. So what is freedom of information? Um, the idea of freedom of information is that citizens should be able to access uh, documents and material held by governments, particularly about they themselves and sometimes to do with other government processes. Now the extent to which they get that access is determined by the actual wording of the particular freedom of information legislation. Typically where freedom of information is available within government departments, there are certain officers who are assigned to handle such requests and there are appeal systems in place both through those government departments or government agencies uh, right through to the um, privacy commissioner, federal agencies that uh, have the ultimate power, and then to the federal court in the case of the Commonwealth Freedom of Information legislation, which is the ultimate arbiter of whether someone has access to certain information. Now this is of course in, of interest uh, to citizens, citizens themselves because sometimes we would like to know um, what public record there is, perhaps of our health or our traffic offences and the like. Um, but it is of vital interest to journalists, particularly investigative journalists, and sometimes to political parties, uh, to make formal requests for certain documents or uh, items of communication within government to, um, to bring that information to the broader public. And that, that becomes, um, that introduces some of the problems with freedom of information. Sadly, in some jurisdictions, freedom of information has started uh, quite cynically to be called freedom from information because of three main factors. In some jurisdictions, the costs of applying for information, particularly if it's not to do with oneself, have been rising and uh, you might be charged for the public servant's time in searching for your request. Now for a particularly broad request of government information this might amount to many thousands of dollars. Um, so the trick with freedom, freedom of information is to make the request quite narrow and essentially often to have done much of your legwork before making the freedom of information request, perhaps by talking to confidential sources and then getting the exact date of the document and asking for that particular document. The next issue is time, because uh, we all know that the public service operates quite slowly and while each Freedom of Information or Right to Information Act dictates that requests need to be answered within a relatively short time frame, perhaps a month, um, it often is the case that this doesn't happen because of under-resourced government departments or um, uh, applications for extension of time. So FOI or RTI is not something that journalists will normally use 
in the cut and thrust of 24-7 uh, reporting. It's more the domain of specialists operating as investigative reporters, uh, often attached to investigative units in the larger media organisations who have the time and resource available to be able to make such application. The other problem though, and uh, some cases in this area are mentioned in the textbook, are uh, the number of exemptions to the issue of information that governments are allowed to, uh, to issue and uh, to call upon as an excuse for not uh, forking out the, the, the information. And these uh, rel can relate to a range of topic areas, defence, national security, people's privacy and confidentiality, uh, a, host of, um, a host of exceptional areas. So journalists need to learn these, but the more, um, the more liberal legislation, uh, that, that is, uh, the, that is uh, more advantageous to journalists, is that with uh, fewer exemptions. I might say that the courts have ruled and some of the higher courts have ruled in favour of the media in some of these cases and have overruled those exemptions. Uh, the textbook also gives you a couple of examples of where journalists at different levels um, have been able to make freedom of information requests work for them. And they really have uh, uncovered some very important stories. So look to those case studies in the textbook for those examples. Uh, finally, uh, in this mini lecture, I'd like to refer you again to the study plan. And I hope by now you are starting to follow that routine of watching this little mini lecture, talking conversationally about the topic area, working your way through the textbook chapter and the lectures, getting your head around the basic learning problem, and then looking in detail for the answers to the learning problem uh, in discussion with your colleagues on the discussion board. Don't forget those mini quizzes uh, that are done at the end of each module. So um, uh, together, those items should provide a, an appropriate scaffold for your learning in media law. I'll see you next time.